I am so glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Today, each and every single time that I can come into the house of the Lord, I am so, so thankful. But again, I'm so glad that worship isn't just here, but worship is who we are and that we can worship and enter into his presence wherever we're at because of what he has done for us. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with us to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. won't keep you long tonight. Many people, and as you're turning there, many people as, uh, may be wondering, why are y'all going into church? And we planted this church not knowing at the time when we were deciding the dates back in October when we were planted out and getting the work done. And we settled upon this date that way the church would have been open and in operation for five weeks before Easter came because that is generally when churches are filled mostly is at Easter and at Christmas time. And never did we imagine in a million years that uh, the time that the date that we picked would be right in the middle of uh, what is going on in our world today. And a lot of people will say, are you worried? And, and uh, are you even going to go through with? Well, absolutely, because right now, what better time than to be planning a church, amen? Because people need hope. And uh, again, many may say, well, why did you do it? Well, I will tell you, we did it for the 730 people that watched online this morning. That's why we did it. And I am so thankful. And I knew in my heart all week, and that's why I uttered it this morning, uh, that I would minister to probably more people this morning than I ever have before. Not in the traditional way in which many would have thought in the house, but because of online. And let me tell you, the word of God, again, is not bound. The spirit of God goes past these four walls. I was encouraged. My mom was watching along with my grandpa. And she said, son, she said, before you got done with that interaction, I was in full on tears, you know, and could feel the spirit and the presence of almighty God right there. And I'm telling you, the Lord is doing great and mighty things, great and mighty, mighty things. And. We got comments and people saying, thank you for having church today and please pray for us. We're being that visible witness. We're being that visible light that Christ has called us to be. And right now, more than ever before, people need the word of Almighty God. We need preaching. And let me tell you, that, that don't need to be the first thing that goes. We need to preach. And it don't matter if we end up having a shutdown. If I got to get on Facebook and hit the piano strum a guitar we're going to preach amen because that's what people need now more than ever before a lot of people say well that's silly and that's foolish well i'm standing up the the word of almighty god amen and i'm going to give people what i know will work because it's the only thing that works i said it before you hope better not be in the rnc or the dnc but better be in christ and his name is jesus amen so hebrews chapter 12 we'll just be reading the first two verses of scripture if you're there say amen Amen. And the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Two verses here, but a lot of truth that is chock full into this. And if there's ever been a time that the title of my message is, is, is important and is needed, it is now. And the message that I will be preaching, I'm ministering again just for a few moments on the title, Running the Race. Running the Race. Amen. Because if you are saved and you of Jesus Christ, and I trust that everyone is here, then you are on a journey, amen? We are, we are running a race right now. It's not in the uh, typical manner in which we would think of running a race in the physical, but spiritually speaking, we are running a race. And if we don't know how to run this race, then we're going to experience what's called burnout. And there have been many that have tread upon this race, have begun this journey, and because Faith is misplaced, and because they are not running it the way that they ought to, they have fallen short. But if we'll run it the way that Christ has told us to run it, then you know, we are guaranteed to cross that finish line. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you today again for your presence. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for another opportunity to come together. And God, we, we don't take it for granted. It seems like for far 
Lord, much of the church, we took it for granted. But, Lord, we don't take it for granted. And we are so thankful, Lord, that we get the opportunity to come together again, Lord. We thank you for what you did this morning for the hearts and lives that were touched here. And also those that are online, Lord, we are so encouraged in knowing, God, that your word is going forth and it is touching hearts and, and changing lives. Lord, and for the testimonies that came in, God, and we are just believing, God, that you're going to continue to do the work that you have started, Lord. God, I'm asking that one more time tonight would rest upon my lips, Lord, that every word that is spoken will be saturated in oil. Lord, I pray that you would help me to rightly divide the word, Lord, speaking only that which you would have me to speak, and we will not fail to give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, and everyone say Amen and amen. As a Christian, a born-again believer, we've been instructed and commanded by God to live by faith. You see, we see it first in the book of Habakkuk 2, 3, where he tells us that the just shall live by faith. Then Paul goes on to, again, repeat it in Romans 1, 17, referencing the same thing, just shall live by faith, and again goes on over to 1038, and again, if believing that the writer of Hebrews is, in fact, the Apostle Paul, Paul again would reference this same scripture again, letting us know that God will have no pleasure in the one who draws back, but that the just shall live by faith. And let me say, it, anything Jesus says is important. If he said it one time, it's important. But when he speaks it a second time, he's saying, pay attention. But when he starts speaking it a third time and a fourth time we really need to hone in on that the just shall live by faith we don't live by feelings we don't live by works we don't live according to whether how circumstances play in and out for us but we live simply by faith it's faith and grace that brought you in faith and grace that keep we have to live that way because outside, let me again i've said it before and i'll say it again you don't always feel on top of that mountain and there's going to be times that you get up and, and days that you face before you and it seems like everything's going wrong and it seems like God's a million miles away. But he's right there, amen, because he said he never leave us and not forsake us. And so we live by faith and faith alone. Amen. So again, we, we've been called to live this in, in no other way. And, and faith in any other object will rob one of abundant living and experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit that you and I need in order to be to live for him. The Bible says that Satan has come, the thief has come to do nothing but to steal, kill, and destroy. And what Satan desires to do nothing more is to destroy our faith, to get us to simply believe him. He can't get our soul because we have trusted in Jesus Christ. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And he comes to us in every which way and works crafty and he is cunning. And let me tell you, he never runs ideas of ways to squirm on in there but but each and every single time if we'll hold on to Jesus we can't deter from the faith we live by faith in every situation that we face day in and day out but in order for us to experience his power in order for us to experience that abundant life that Christ has died Again, he's not just died to give us eternal life, but he's died to give us an abundant life. You and I as Christians, as children of the Most High King, should be walking around just barely getting by. It's time for you and I, the church, to rise up and begin to live in the overflow of that which he has died to give. He's died to give us abundant life. And when our faith is centered in him and we realize that everything that we need, I mean everything that we need, is found in Christ and believing that he's already paid the price it removes the pressure off of you and you say Lord you've done it I believe that you've accomplished it and I receive it simply stated that's just the way that it's got to be but the problem is is that we can't get ourselves out of the way because it is not within our human nature to get out of the way and let God be God you see it all down through the Bible. We get in this and things happen like that. And I'm the first one. I'm preaching to myself. All of a sudden, that human nature within inside of us steps forth. And we think we got to begin to fix the problem. When what he wants us to do is start trusting him, acknowledge the problem, hand it over to him and say, Lord, I give this to you. We would save ourselves as the church, as Christians, a whole lot of pain and a whole lot of heartache if we would just simply turn it over to him. If we would just simply give it to him and let God be God, if we would just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. 
But we're not careful many times, just like the children of Israel. There they was. And God had brought them out of Egyptian bondage. They were happy. Everything was going good. And the first obstacle that they ran into, what do they do? They begin to grumble and they begin to complain. God knew where he was taking them. God led them there. In fact, I believe to prove to them the power that he possessed. If it wasn't enough that he brought them out of Egyptian bondage, he was ready to open up the Red Sea for them. Showing that I will make a way of escape. Amen. And he has made a way for you and I. Amen. So a lot of times when going through life and the challenges that we face, we draw strength and encouragement from looking to others that have went through similar hardships and through difficulties that we face. Because whenever you're facing something, you often like to hear from those who have went through the same thing. And it was a couple of months ago, I was at the hospital visiting a co-worker at that time of mine's uh, brother who was there. And her daddy was about 87 years old and a dear, godly brother, loving to death, was sitting there talking. And it's just second nature that when people are talking to me, I don't know about you, have the tendency to go, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, I know. And all of a sudden, his sister-in-law corrects. She said, look at him over there say, yeah, I know. And you don't have a clue. <laughs> and it hit me, I don't know. Because I've not walked the paths that he was talking about. I've not experienced what he said that he had went and she reminded me that and she wasn't being mean, but it was a general rebuke. I don't know what it meant. I can't sit back and say, oh, yeah, I know, because I don't know, because I haven't walked the paths of it. Amen. But we've got one who has already went before us, and he's already endured that path. He's already went before you and conquered everything. So when maybe some people don't know, don't know this, don't know that, we've got one who knows it all. We got one who's already went before you. He's already accomplished what it is that you need. And we can go to him. And he goes, yes, I know. He knew before you ever even came to it. He knew before the obstacle ever came your way. What we're experiencing right now in our nation does not catch God by surprise. It caught us by surprise. It really caught us by surprise. But not God. He's still God. He's the beginning, the end, the first and the last, and everything in between. He's omniscient, omnipotent. He knows everything. So he knew what was getting ready to take place. Amen. We didn't, but he did. So Paul calls our attention to run this race, but prefaces by letting us know that we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. So he informs us that there have been those that went before us whose faith was an example to us who are presently running this race. Let me tell you, you're not in this alone. Look around you. You've got brothers and sisters in the Lord that are running the same race that you're running tonight. Not just here, but in all the cities and other towns and throughout this country, throughout this world. There are others that are on the same journey that are running the same race that you and I are doing. But at times we think, Lord, I'm the only one. We think we're the only one going through it. We think we're the only one facing it. But you're not. Each and every single one of us have our own set of circumstances, our own individual trials. The Lord, I believe, has handpicked out for each and every single one of us, we're all in this together facing different things, but yet it's not unordinary for, for the Lord. He knows exactly what you're going through. So you may think, well, I'm the only one facing this. No, no. All of our brothers and sisters are facing temptations. They're facing the enemy. We've all got trials and we've all got tribulations. We all have failures that comes our way. None is exempt from them. Amen. So we draw strength from those who give their testimony of what God has done for them in their life. And whenever we hear the testimony of God's faithfulness, it causes something to rise within you. And growing up like that, they used to have the testimony services, if you will. And unfortunately, they got a little bit too long because some people just didn't know when to stop. And we would be there three and four hours and I would just be, yeah, we get it. The Lord's good. We was wore out. But yet people would stand up and would testify well. But it don't have to just be a church. We should be testifying of him outside of these four walls. We should be speaking of his goodness. We should be speaking of what he's done for us. If that's all you've got to say, how Jesus saved your soul, that's enough. But yet God has been good to each and every single one of us, has moved in our life, has blessed us in tremendous ways. So we should be out there. And when you begin to give that testimony, when you begin to exalt the name of Jesus and you begin to do that, it will lift up other individuals that are of the faith and say, if they can make it, I can make it as well. Because God's got no respect to persons. Amen. 
So that testimony that we have like that will lift up other individuals that is in the faith. And when you hear what God has done, there's something inside of you says, oh, Lord, he can do it for me as well. Faith will begin to rise. Amen. So this great cloud of witnesses that he says we are compassed with is in reference previous chapter which we know as is the faith chapter or faith's hall of fame chapter 11 we've all read it. it starts out that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen and you go all the way through it and you see the same common denominator and how god used these people and how he was able to work in their life and it was always by faith by faith, amen. So, and within this chapter, we find those that God moved tremendously in and through their lives. And again, the common denominator was by faith. See, they were normal like you and I. And a lot of people seem to think that when they read about Moses, they read about Abraham, they read about uh, Joshua, they read about Ruth, they read about now, they read about all of these patriarchs of the faith, and they think they must have just spent, they just held them up on this, this statue of thinking it was just something wonderful. Listen, they were ordinary human beings just like you and I. I. Amen. They had their failures just like you and I. I mean, look at Moses. He started out his ministry by killing a man. Right. Abraham lied. But it was grace then, just like it's grace now. Amen. So the God used these individuals, and it says should be a declaration, be an example before us that God is able to use you and I. All he needs is just one that be that had just dared to believe him. That will just step out in faith and believe God for the impossible. That will go against the grain. That will go against what seems like everybody else is going to say, you know what? I don't care what you say. I hear what you say. But I believe God. A lot of people think we're crazy for planting this church here. And we've heard it. People are out there talking on the street. They've got this idea that we're just some charismatic church. That we're crazy. And I'm glad this is going live stream so they can see that, that if we're fanatics. We're fanatics about Jesus. We preach Christ and Him crucified. We believe in the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. We still believe in the operating power of the Holy Spirit. We still believe that He saves, that He heals, that He delivers. Amen. And He does it all. Amen. Amen. But God, a lot of people would think, well, you're crazy for doing it. But I know what God had called us to do. And I know that God has planted us here for such a time as this. Amen. And it's not just Stacy and my family, but it's others that are already here. You have been right here in the trenches already. Many of you watching my own line, you think that we've done it all ourselves. Oh, no. God started providing before we ever opened up the Amen. doors. We got people in the media. We got people running scriptures so that you can see. We've got anointed musicians. We've got anointed singers that just says, I want more of Jesus and I want to be used by God. And for such a time as this, we are here and we are believing for the impossible. Amen. We're believing for the impossible. This is exciting time to me because I know what's going to come from all of this because God is awakening the church, as I said this morning. And from this, he's going to birth a great revival, not just here, but all around this land of those that are seeking his face, those that are praying, saying, God, we just want you, that are coming back to the basics of prayer, of faith, and grace, and getting away from all of this other junk that should have never been part of the church to begin with, but coming back to the basics of lifting up the name that is above every other name, the one who it's all about, and his name is Jesus Christ. Because yes. it's all about him. We've yes. made it. I know I'm going off on this. But we made it about everything else. We're trying to make our name known. I could care less if anybody knows my name. But what name I want them to know is Jesus Christ. I didn't die for anyone. I can't save anyone. But there is a man who went to Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago that bled and died for you. And that's the only name that you need to know. The name of Jesus. Amen. The one that we sang about tonight. The name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So each of these great patriarchs of the faith were given to use as examples of those that maintain their faith in the Redeemer that would be sent down to earth to pay the terrible sin debt that man owed. See, it was by faith and faith alone. Okay? It was by faith and faith alone that caused them to be included here as witnesses unto the testimonies to us. These patriarchs that were here in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews is not in there because of anything that they've done. But it was all because of what God done through them because they exhibited faith. Amen. And their faith was not in the one that we now look back to, but their faith was in the one who was to come. Amen. 
Their faith was in the one who God would send down into this world. His name is Jesus. They looked ahead. They hadn't yet seen it, but they believed God. Going back to Genesis 15, 6. And Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him, imputed unto him for righteousness. All because he simply believed God. That's how simple justification is. That's how simple salvation is. It's simply by believing and trusting and accepting what he has promised and also now what he has done. See, before they looked ahead, it hadn't yet been accomplished, but they believed God that it was going to come to pass. Now you and I look back in faith and believe that it has come to pass. Amen. So we're in the same boat as the patriarchs before. They never seen it. We haven't seen it. But yet we've come together to believe that what they know was futuristic. We now look to the past and know without a shadow of a doubt because of what has taken place in our heart and life that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and that he has paid the ultimate sin, the debt of sin that you and I could not pay. Amen. And that he accomplished it all. You see, we now have a better covenant based off of better promises. And that better is Jesus Christ and his shed blood. That's right. yes. Thank God. You better hear me tonight. We got a better covenant based off of better promises. I don't know about you, but I've got no desire for the law whatsoever. Because the law is nothing more but bondage. You see, what before man could not live by the law, therefore they had to offer up the sacrifices typifying of the one who would come. Now the work has already been done. I'm not to try to live by law. I'm to live by faith. In the one who has already came, fulfilled the law. Yes, we're to abide by the word of God. In fact, the word of God says, if you'll love me, you'll keep my commandments. But the last time that I checked, nobody here is able to keep the, all the commandments within themselves. But in the eyes of God, because you have been baptized unto his death, because you have been buried with him, that old man is dead, and you've been resurrected as a new man in Christ Jesus, God now looks at you and I as perfect law keepers. As one who has never sinned a day in our life. And we got to get a hold of that. And much of the church is missing that today. Because they're based in their salvation. They're based in their sanctification. They're based in their walk with the Lord off of their performance. Let me tell you. You will never perform up to the standard that God has set. That's right. So you should be living by the standard of the one that he sent. And that standard is Jesus Christ, the one who kept the law and kept it perfectly. Amen. So all these patriarchs of the faith made it again because of their faith of the one who was to come. Of the one who was to come. And I said it before that these great men, these great patriarchs of the faith had their failures just like you and I have. And let me tell you, God can deal with failure, but he cannot deal with quitters. That's right. Mm -hmm. He can deal with failure all day long, and that is contrary to the belief of a lot of people. It wasn't to mine. And it kept me in a constant state of worry when I was growing up because I thought, God, is this going to eventually kick me out the door? I am failing him over and over and over again. He's not going to keep forgiving me. But my Bible says that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. It doesn't matter if you fail a thousand times. It's the fact that you get back up one thousand and one times. Amen? Amen? He can deal with failure. But what he can't deal with is quitters. Because those that quit on the Lord are saying, I no longer believe. I no longer believe in this Jesus. I'm no longer trusting in what he's done and that it is enough for me. Failures all day long, absolutely. Because we bring it to the Lord. He is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and all sin. But quitters, he cannot deal with. So no matter how weak you feel, keep trusting Jesus. It doesn't matter how bad it may seem like, keep looking to his blood. Keep looking to the nail-scarred hands. Keep looking to his might. Hold on to him with everything you got. Because I promise you, as I said it before, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning and the best is still yet to come. Amen. Amen. The best is still yet to come. This ain't as good as it gets. Because the ultimate best that's coming is Jesus Christ when we go home to be with him for all of eternity. Going back to what I preached about this morning. But even before the rapture of the church, oh, there's still a whole lot that we ain't yet seen. And what an exciting time to be alive. To know that we are going to be a part of this last great move of the Holy Spirit. Yes. I think about those in the book of Acts and, and reading it of how, what it must have been like. To, to see the miracles that were performed. 
To see the healings that had taken place. To see uh, the one preaching and 3,000 come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ at one time. And then turn around and another 5,000 come to know Jesus Christ. And I think if the Lord reminded me the other week in prayer, he took me right back to Acts chapter 2 where Peter preached the inaugural message. And he said, if I did it before, I'll do it again. I'm going to do it again. I believe that. Many may say, I don't believe it. Well, I could care less what you believe. I believe that it's going to take place because he saves the best for last. Amen. Psalms 56 and 3 says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. And I put this on the church's website the other day in preparation for this message because it's a timely scripture. And in this scripture here, this uh, scripture, this psalm was written by the, uh, David. And David acknowledged the fact that he was afraid. And a lot of times we sit back and we think that we can't be honest with ourselves or tell other people that we fear. But fear is natural. And the Lord knew we were going to fear. That's why he tells us in his Bible, a lot of people say 365 times, whichever way you like to read it, whether it be fear not or, or don't be afraid or whatever like that. But he tells us this over and over and over and over again. I understand that you're fear, but when you fear, start trusting in me. Because that's the answer for fear. As I heard one say today, when fear comes knocking, answer the door with faith. Answer the door with faith. Because when we live in fear, we're ultimately saying, God, I don't know if you can handle this problem. When we live and operate in fear, we're saying, God, I don't know if you can fix this. Now, we sing about that with God, all things are possible. We lift our hands, we say it, we say it. But then when push comes to shove and we're in those situations that where fear begins to creep in, are we really trusting the Lord? Do we truly believe that he can handle it? And this is, again, I'm not throwing anything out because I'm preaching to myself. Because situations are going to come, they're going to arise. When that time of fear comes like that, that creeps in, what are we going to do? Are we going to trust the Lord? Or are we going to live in fear? You see, how could he say this? How can we say this? Because we know in whom we have believed. We know that our Redeemer lives. Amen. So those who Paul would write to were Christian Jews who were insisting on continuing in temple worship. They were attempting to marry law with Christ and continue on in it. And this angered God more than anything because instead of placing faith exclusively and totally in what Christ had done, they were trying to interject law as a means of sanctification and as a means of worship which had all been fulfilled in Christ. It's much like the church today. It ain't so much the law of Moses, but we want to say yes to grace, but then we want to interject law in with it. We want to marry the two. Say, yes, you can have your grace, but you also got to do X, Y, and Z. And much of the church is there. And where it may not necessarily be the law of Moses, it will be man's law. Well, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do this. You got to do that. It seems like most denominations, they got a whole bunch of bylaws before you can become a member. But let me tell you, to become a member of the kingdom of God, my Bible says all you got to do is be saved. Covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because again, it's not based off of what you do. It's not based off of what I do. But it's based off of the one who has already done it for us. So when we try to attempt to marry law with grace. When we try to bring the two together. What in fact what we are doing is committing spiritual adultery. We're cheating on Christ because we're saying, I don't know that you've taken care of everything. I'm not trusting solely in your blood. So therefore, I'm going to come over here and also bring this up along with it and try to bring the two together. And you can't do that. You can't be trying to operate up underneath law and grace too. It's either one or the other. And I don't know about you, but I want to operate 100% totally under grace. I want that uninterrupted flow of His grace to work in my heart and life. And the way that that takes place is by simple faith in Christ and what He's done. And not moving it away from it. See, when we say that we, you have to have it exclusively in Christ and what He's done, it's not that people get mad that you say... You talk about the cross. It's not that people get mad that you talk about the blood. They say, oh yes, but they want to also add to. But when we add to the cross of Christ, when we add to the finished work, finished being the operative word, 
then we have nullified grace from working in our heart and life. The way grace works in mind of your life is by simply trusting and not moving our faith away from Christ. Even in the midst of our failures, keep your faith anchored in Christ. Amen. So again, it's no different. The church as a whole, again, doesn't deny the cross of Christ as the Jews did, but they ignore it. And when you try to bring law and grace together, it does not mix. It's like oil and water. The two don't mix together. Law and grace doesn't mix together as well. So Paul here is stating that we should follow the example of the witnesses that were before us by strictly, strictly looking to the person and the work that was done. As they look to the one who was going to come, we should be just like them and look back to the one who has already came and done the work. So Paul here tells us that we too are to lay aside every weight and the sin that so, does so easily be set us and run with patience the race that is set before us. Now here's the problem. We believe it's by faith. We, we believe, we accept that those in the Old Testament were looking toward that those that have been since Jesus comes now look back to it. We get all of that. But when, here's the problem. Here's where the rubber meets the road. When we start saying laying aside, laying aside the weight and the sin, the sin that so easily beset us, this is where the problem is. Because most people want to do it within themselves. Most people says, okay, I'm going to lay it aside. But instead of, what they, instead of laying it aside, they, be, they get burdened down with more and more and more. You see, not laying aside the weight and sin will cause one to be hindered in this race that we are to run. See, so you're on a race to heaven. You're on a journey to heaven. And as you begin to run this race, and I've done some running before on a treadmill, and I'm not going to attempt to run, but you do your running, you run all across and everything like that, and you're good because it's just you. But here's the problem. The weights, we'll deal with the weights, and I brought in weights today. All of a sudden, we got troubles and trials that come our way. And as we're running our race with nothing in our hands, if I was physically running this, I can run faster when I've got nothing detached to me. But he says, lay aside the waste. All of a sudden, problems come my way. All of a sudden, tribulations come my way. Law wants to interject itself in, and it will weigh you down. So as I'm running without the ways, I can run faster. But all of a sudden, I have picked up law. I have picked up what I think that I need to do. I've interjected that in, and all of a sudden, I begin to be weighed down. And the more that you run this race and the more that you continue on that, and it's easy for a while to begin to run this race. Right now, these are five-pound weights. And as I'm running, as I'm walking, it's no big deal. I feel a little bit of strain that's there. But nevertheless, I'm still running and doing real good. But then as the journey continues to go on, then the next thing I know, more weight comes, and then I start feeling the pressure and the strain anymore. So now I've went from five pounds up to the 15 pounds. And all of a sudden, I can't run as fast as I one time was. I began to slow down on this journey of life. I began to slow down while I'm running the race and I began to breathe a little bit harder and can't pace my breathing, which is so, so important when it comes to running any race in the physical. They will tell you that it's how you pace yourself. But I'm running across here and I can't run as fast as I one time was or I'm not running as free as I one time was because I have got weight here and because I'm trying to live for the Lord by the means of law. Trials come my way. Tribulations come my way. Storms come my way. And what have I done? Only thing that I've done is pick them up and I'm carrying them with me. And then the next thing, instead of us running with our shoulders up, running for the Lord, we find many Christians are like this. Weighed down. Hump batched over when we should be like this. Our shoulders square back. I'm in, I'm in the army for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a blood-bought child of God. My Jesus has done it all for me. And instead, because we're, we won't lay aside the weight like that, because we're trying to do it within ourselves and by our own means, we're weighed down and we can barely keep going. Sin that happens in our life, failures that comes in our life, all of a sudden we, we want to get rid of them. We don't like the sin that's within our life. So we try within our own strength to get rid of I'm already out of breath. <laughs> we try to get rid of the sin that's in our life. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. You've all been on that path. Let me die. And I know I'm not the only one here. Because before understanding that Christ has done it all, I was trying to get rid of it. And then what happened was because the more law that I was interjected in to try to get freedom from what Christ has already set me free from, now I've moved on here, dear Lord, to the 35 pounds each. It's 70, y'all, not 35. It's 35 in each hand. And now when I was running the race, now I am barely going. Yes. And where I started out running, then I started out jogging, then I started out walking, and now I find myself to the place to where I'm just stopping. Yeah. That's right. Amen. I'm so weighed down that I cannot even go anymore. And as hard as I'm trying to get rid of this sin, as hard as I'm trying to lay it outside because I'm doing it within my own strength, but yet the sin and the weight ain't coming off. Right. And it won't come off. You know why? Because you're trying to get rid of it within your own strength. But then when I start looking to Christ, and I start saying, Lord, I believe in what you did 2,000 years ago. I believe that the answer for my problem is found in your blood. I believe that you've accomplished it all for me at Calvary. I believe that what Colossians says, that you made an open show of them, triumphing over every power of darkness. And then all of a sudden, the weights and the sand falls off. Right. You better be happy about that tonight. Now I'm able to start running again. Now I'm able to start running this race again. And I don't have the weight and the sand that is on me anymore. Because I'm not trying to get rid of it on my own. But I place my faith in the one who has already done it. And now I can run this race free from the weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Amen. Yes, he that the Son has set free is free indeed. You don't have to carry around weight. You don't have to carry around sin. And I'm going back to the fives. You don't have to carry this stuff around anymore. He has set you free. All you've got to do is keep your faith anchored in Christ through what He's done. And the power of the Holy Spirit is what keeps these things off of you. Amen. Because you're not keeping it yourself. And you're letting the one who has already accomplished the work come and do what needs to be done. Amen? Amen. I am out of breath. <laughs> the enemy takes full advantage of this. And makes you think you might as well give up. Yes. You see we're way down. And I didn't get to feel the illustration. Because the weight's got so bad. But when I get over here. Let's move back. When I get over here. And I've all of a sudden. I went from running. I went to jogging. I went to walking. I went to slow walking. And I found myself in this position. Where I can't go anymore. I can't go anymore. I'm so weighed down. And let me tell you, there are more Christians than what we realize that are so weighed down with the burdens of life. It shows upon their faces like that. And God never meant for you to carry the burdens of life. He never meant for you to deal with them. He meant for you to come to Him, lay it all down at His feet. And believe that he's already took care of what's happened. But then when we quit running, when we quit moving forward, and we find ourselves right here, then all of a sudden from standing, we began to sit down. And then when we get sit down, the waist are still there. And then we find ourselves quite possibly looking back from where we come from. We're looking back from where we come from. And that's not the position that we're to be in. Grace ever moves forward. Law goes backwards. Amen. And we don't need to go back. We need to continue to go forward in believing and trusting in what he has done. So even if you don't feel that you have the strength to get up, you may be sitting down. Don't be discouraged. You can get up and start again. Let me tell you, I've been on this race before. I'm on this race now as all of us. And I have found myself. And we can find ourselves from day to day being weighed down with the weights of life. Let me tell you something. It's each and every single day. But do you know how that you live this abundant life? Do you know how that you can go through here and not carry the weight? By doing what Luke chapter 9 verse 23 says. And denying yourself and taking up the cross and following him daily. We are to deny our own strength. We are to deny our own ability. And believe and take up what Christ has done. Meaning Christ has already finished the work. And now follow him. Lord, I'm taking up what you've done. Now the benefits I want to flow to me. And I can follow him and run this race with the endurance that is needed. Amen. So we cry out unto the Lord to help me. We're way down and we say, Lord, I can't do this anymore. Come and help me. I don't know what else to do. And you're in the best position where you can be. Because now you have denied yourself. 
And you realize that you within your own strength can't help yourself. You can't defeat the problem. And all of a sudden I believe the Holy Spirit reminds us what 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Verse 10 goes on to say that reproaches, persecutions, and distresses that I am in, I will take pleasure. Because when I am weak, then I am made strong. His grace is sufficient. The Holy Spirit is sufficient for whatever it is that you're going through. Amen. So this again is where the Holy Spirit, the power of God comes to play by us denying ourselves and taking up what he has done. Matthew 11, 20 through 30 tells us to come all of you that are heavy laden and labor come to me and I will give you rest. Let me tell you something. This rest isn't just a one time stop. This rest is not just only at salvation, but it's a continual rest that you and I can enter in. But what do we have to do? Come unto me. We get heavy laden. We're in the real world. We're all human beings. We get weighed down with problems. And the only way that you're going to get rid of them weights is by coming unto him and laying them down at the foot of the cross. The problem is we come to the foot of the cross, we come to him, my problems, and then we get right back up and we have taken them weights right back with us. Because we won't simply deny ourselves. We won't simply deny ourselves and trust God to move upon our problems. So regardless of how hard it is, uh, we are able to run with patience because the truth is none of us have faith quite as strong as we think we do. But when we're in this race, we're growing each and every single day. Our faith is not quite as strong as we think it is. When it comes times of testing and tribulation, we realize that. We think we're on cloud nine headed for ten and we think everything's good. The devil can so uh, serve us any blow whatsoever, knock us off. And then all of a sudden here comes a trial of tribulation out of nowhere. And you think, dear Lord, where did that come from? And our faith gets tried. And we find ourselves not necessarily exhibiting that kind of faith that Christ wants us to do. And we get so weighed down. But Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident in this very thing, that he which has begun a good work yes, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We've got to be confident of that. That means you better take a hold of that and then run with it while you're on this race that he's begun a good work in me and he's going to perform it. So even though I may have problems, even though I may have struggles, even though weights come and the sin comes, the failures come and all this other stuff, I can place my confidence in the one who said that he's begun a good work. And let me tell you, every good work that he has begun, he will perform it meaning he does the work you don't perform this work he does it he will strip the things away from you take the weights off of your life you gotta let him do it but the problem is we want to perform the good work right. you can't perform the good work you can't sanctify yourself you can't do anything because if you could if righteousness come by the law then Christ is dead in vain Right. He's got to be the one to do it because he's the only one that can do it. And because of what he did at, cry, at the cross, it has given the Holy Spirit the legal means to be able to do the work that we need him to do. See, many are running a race, but it's in the wrong direction. And unless they turn around, they'll lose their soul. Because the only way that you can run is straight. I mean, you, you can run in opposite directions, but to run to him, you've got to run straight and true. It's just like in the physical race, whatever direction that your eyes are looking, that's the direction that your body and feet's going to go in. So Paul tells us what we need to do in verse 1, and in verse 2, he tells us how to do it. By looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's how we, we lay aside the weight. That's how the weight and the sin that so easily besets us. That's how we can lay it aside by looking unto Jesus. But if our eyes are not fixated upon him, and here's us as sheep, and if you don't know, sheep are some of the dumbest animals, shining objects comes our way, and we thought, oh, that looks good. That glitters, that glamours, that looks good. And all of a sudden, we've taken our eyes off of Christ. We've taken it off of what he's already done, and that looks nice. That looks and all of a sudden where we should be laying straight, we should be going straight and our feet follows our eyes. And all of a sudden we look over here and where I was going straight, then all of a sudden I find myself going this way. Mm -hmm. Amen. And when I go that way, then everything that I, what happens is, is I begin to pull on weights. Sin. All of this stuff that he's died to, for us to be able to be free from. 
But thanks be to God that this is where grace comes into play at, that he will chastise us, that he will let things happen to us to grab a hold of our attention. And though I may be going this direction, all of a sudden I can do an about turn and I can start again on my journey. As long as you don't go backward, but you go forward, that's all that matters. Amen. So in a physical race, just as a one that is running the race, they've got to be hydrated. There's got to be a replenishment of water. You see people on the race and then people are on the side there with cups and there's water in them because they want to drink that water because they're sweating. On this road that we're on, this race that we're running, we've got to have water, spiritual water that comes through and by the Holy Spirit. So if we're trying to do this upon our own, that we need, we need, again, that replenishment of the oil that I was talking about this morning. We need the Holy Spirit who is a type of water to flow and to, to pour into us. And thanks be to God that as he pours it, you can run this race like never before. But you're not going to run this race without being hydrated, spiritually speaking, just like you want in a physical. You try to run it without water and you don't stay hydrated up, then you will find yourself slowing down to the point of exhaustion and then you're just falling out. And you're giving up. Yes. We've got to have the flow of the Holy Spirit, that water in our heart and in our life. So when the believer fails, they aren't to focus on their failure that they just played in because they just played it to the enemy's hand. You acknowledge your sin and bring it to him and allow him to remove it. And let me just say this. If we're honest about ourselves, when we acknowledge our sin, it will always bring us to the conclusion that we have taken our eyes off of Jesus and his finished work. When David acknowledged the sin that was before him, when you come to acknowledge the sin that you have done, that we all mess up, the conclusion will really always be that we have taken our eyes off of Christ and what he's done. And it led us down the wrong path that we were on. But thanks be to God that again, we can come to him, we can receive that grace that we need, we can receive the forgiveness that we need, and he will cleanse us from it, and we can start again. But those things should remind us and we should learn from it. Hey, keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't move it away from him. Amen. So the cross of Jesus Christ leads one to the very presence of God because the cross is the foundation where God can meet man man can experience his mercy and grace that's where you experience god's mercy and his grace and it's at the cross that's the only place where god can meet you that's the only place where god can meet me the only place he can meet any man is at the cross where mercy and grace will always meet you there amen so as the author the finish of our faith this road that you are traveling on is a road that christ has already went before you and we need to know that he has already encountered every evil spirit and has already won the victory for you and I. Amen. He's already won it. And because he defeated every single power of darkness and conquered every problem, that is why he said he is now set down at the right hand of the Father. Amen. When I come in from a long day's work or whatever I'm doing, I don't sit down until what? The work is done. But when I sit down for that day, I say the work that I needed to do is done. I can now sit down. Let me tell you, Jesus did the work. He's already accomplished it. He said it is finished. And when he sat down, he sat down and he ain't getting back up because he's already done it. The next time he gets back up is when he's coming back for his bride. Because he's already done the work. He's already accomplished for it. He endured the cross with joy because he knew that he was defeating every power of darkness, every trouble, every trial that would ever come your way. He was taking care of it on the road to Calvary. So when you're getting way down and you feel tired and running this road, remember, Jesus traveled a road for you and it was all the way to the cross. Yes. So that you and I can now run this race with endurance all the way to the end. By looking to the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Jordan, if you'll come up and just play something quietly. Again, as we run this race, we're going to encounter bumps all along the way. And you're going to encounter good times and bad times. But the answer is the same in any and every situation. That is Christ. In his blood. So if you'll stand to your feet tonight, I don't, I don't know where you may find yourself in your walk with the Lord. But the commission is the same to all. That we are to run this race by looking to the author and the finisher of our faith.
We can't run this race any other way, y'all. We're in perilous times. We're in dark times, amen? But you and I have a hope, a blessed hope that is in Christ Jesus. And we can continue to run this race. We can lay aside the way, lay aside the sin. We got to get rid of it. It needs to drop off of us because I'm telling you, it's hard to run this race. And it don't have to be that way. But you can give it all to Jesus by looking to him. And the Holy Spirit will take that weight and that sin away from you. You don't have to carry around the pressure of it. Let him take it from you because it's already taken care of it. Amen. So I want to invite you to come to the altars tonight. We need to seek the face of God now more than ever before. We need to seek him. We say we need revival. We say that, that we need him in every situation. And all of us in here are facing things. Some things that I don't even know about. And I don't need to know about them. He knows about them. So we got to make a decision tonight to give it to him and to let him take it from us. So as he plays, let's come around these altars. Let's seek God. Let's seek him. Let's look to him and ask him for his strength to continue to endure tonight.